Well, good morning this morning. We are glad that you have joined with us. We encourage you, grab a cup of coffee and enjoy worship with one another this morning. We're having a kind of a different service, and I pulled up uh, one that I did back uh, during Good Friday. It's uh, going to be a day where we sing the hymns of the church and sing some of the hymns of the church, and I just encourage you to open yourself up to worshiping with us today and worshiping the Lord. I also encourage you, if you haven't gotten your gift yet, we would love for you to get uh, get your gift throughout this week. We'd love to be able to disperse that to you. We've had several people come by and get them, even ones that aren't able to join us in person. Um, we we hope and we pray that you're able to take some notes while you're while you're listening today, and that the word of God would place itself upon your heart. We're glad to also be able to tell you that we have 44 different people down at uh, camp this week, and uh, they will be gone till Tuesday. We would ask for your prayers. We had a little scabuttle on the way down, and and uh, a fender bender, and we've been, we've been praying for the kids, and no, none of the kids were hurt. We want you to know that. Um, we want to give you assurance on that. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes when you're bringing five vehicles down, uh, you can have some different issues, uh, but we are glad that God has gotten them there. I got uh, assurance today that everything is going well, that they are enjoying worshiping the Lord, and, and that things are really going well, that the presence of God is continuing to meet with them. And we believe that the presence of God is going to continue to meet with us. Let us pray as we get started with worship this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for bringing us into a place where we can gather in your name. Lord, we pray that as we listen to these songs today, that they will speak to our hearts, and later as we open your word, that we will allow your word to speak to us in a way that opens us up to hearing and experiencing you in a fresh and a new way. May the Lord continue to speak to us, and we will thank you and we will praise you. In your son's name we pray, amen and amen. May God continue to bless you as we continue to worship together today with one another. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of love sinners was slain So I cherish the old rugged cross Till my troll Trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Oh, the old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me for the dear lamb of god left his glory above to bear it to dark Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown In the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty 
I see For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died To pardon and sanctify me So I cherish the old rugged cross trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true It's shame and reproach gladly bear Then he'll call me someday To my home far away Where his glory forever I'll share trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown
Welcome, and we are glad that you are here with us today as we step through the beginning of Mark together with one another. We started last week with Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, and this week we get into Mark chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. Last week we looked at the life of John the Baptist and the way that he prepared the way for the coming Messiah that would come. He called people to repentance, to turning around, to coming out into the wilderness where they would open themselves up to the leading of the Holy Spirit as they were baptized in the water. Well, this morning, like I said, we come to Mark chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water... Immediately he saw the heavens being torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Well, from this we see something about baptism once again. And, and in the later part, when Jesus had been resurrected from the dead, he came back to his disciples and spent a series of time with his disciples. And in one of those times, right before Jesus left this earth, he gave us a great commission. And in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, it says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. How are you going to make disciples of all nations? You're going to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Mark uses the word baptize or baptism six times in the first nine verses of this book. Still, this act is surprising. Why was Jesus baptized? I mean, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. It was meant for those who were sorry for their sins and who wished to change. Well, might this imply that Jesus was an evildoer? who was now reforming his ways, or was in some ways subordinate to John? One shouldn't just understand repentance only as a turning away from something evil. It can also be understood positively as a turning toward God. 
Jesus' repentance here represents a true openness to the leading and the guiding of God. Well, today we'll be looking at five reasons that baptism is such a profound moment. Number one, it's a profound moment because it's a moment of decision. Verse 9 says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, what is Nazareth? I know it's the town in which Jesus was brought up, but Nazareth is a small town in the middle of nowhere. It isn't in the region of Galilee, which was despised because of how far it was from Jerusalem and because of its infestation with people that were outside of the faith of the Jewish people. The town of Nazareth was even worse. It was unknown. It was unmentioned anywhere else in the Old Testament. Do you know what this means? Jesus was a nobody from nowhere. Now, you might feel like today that you are a nobody, that you grew up in the wrong place, you grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, your family is so messed up that you can't tell anybody even about it, you you don't have a lot to offer, but remember, Jesus Christ, my friends, was a nobody from nowhere. In Nazareth, Jesus had a close-knit family, a profitable occupation as a carpenter. He had friends, and he had all the fond memories that you would accumulate throughout the years of childhood and youth. But this was the moment. This was the moment of decision for Jesus. Jesus had faithfully done his day's work, and he had discharged his duties to his home, and all the while he must have been waiting for a sign. The emergence of John as the messenger baptizing in the wilderness was that sign. Jesus left it all. He left Nazareth to be baptized by John in the Jordan River. Why in the world did Jesus need to be baptized? Well, in every life, there are moments of decision that come our way which may be accepted or rejected. In each of these circumstances, we have a choice. Jesus had a choice too. He could accept and he could leave Nazareth and put it behind him and he could leave his peaceful, he could leave his sweet home or he could reject what God was asking, which would lead to the undecided life, which is always the wasted life, the frustrated life, the discontented life, and often the tragic life. You see... The drifting life, friends, can never be the happy life. It was truly a momentous decision for Jesus to leave Nazareth in order to be baptized. By being baptized, Jesus was surrendering totally to God's will and to God's direction for his life. You see, the decision to follow Jesus is a momentous decision. It involves the total surrender of all we are and all we have. If we genuinely decide to follow Jesus, we pay the price, my friends, of complete surrender. We lay it all down at the feet of Jesus. However, we must remember, a decision not to follow Christ will lead to discontentment and to drifting, which leads to a wasted and a tragic life. Paul says it this way in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. We've been going through the book of Philippians on Wednesday nights, and I encourage you to also check those out as well. But in Philippians 3, verse 8, it says, Indeed, I count everything as loss. Everything in my past life, everything that people say is worth something, I count it all loss. Why? Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, for his sake and only his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. Why? In order that I may gain Christ. The first reason baptism is such a profound moment is it's a moment of decision. The second reason is that it's a moment of identification. In verse 9, it says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. 
John was calling Israel to acknowledge God's judgment and to come back through the waters. John is calling this memory of something that has happened in the past for these people, of a little boy that floated down the river that got, that got caught and got found by the princess of the whole land that had been, come into this family and had been raised in royalty and all of a sudden found the injustice of his people to be something that he should stand up against and therefore stood up against it in such a way that he took matters into his own hands, took a life of another person, and then hid in the wilderness and ran off into the wilderness. It was there in the wilderness after some 40 years that all of a sudden there was a burning bush one day, and he saw this, and he heard the voice of God calling him to go back to his people whom he had run away from, calling him to go back to those people so that he can make the difference in those people's lives. And he went back, and he called the Pharaoh to let his people go. And in those moments, there was a lot of plagues and a lot of, dis, a lot of uh, disarray going on. But God finally allowed those people to be set free. Now they're out in the wilderness and all of a sudden there's a big body of water and they're wondering how in the world they're going to run from the people that are running after them. And all of a sudden here comes Moses, the one that could have just run away and forgotten about all things, stands up for the people, puts his rod in the, in the water, puts his staff in the water, and all of a sudden the waters are parted. Well, this story would have been there for these people. And here, in the middle of a wilderness, at a body of water, instead of a staff coming into the middle, Jesus Christ comes into the middle of the water, and something profound happens that day. We have a movement of the people of God coming back to God. And with this movement, Jesus was determined to identify himself. You see, Jesus is not repenting from sin. He's not seeking salvation for himself. He's not fleeing from the wrath that is to come. Rather, he is joining in the renewal of the people of God and in the march of God's unfolding purpose for the entire world. And like Moses who gave up his status to identify with his people in order to deliver them from the bondage of slavery. Jesus humbles himself by entering the ranks of sinners and taking his stand with them, and they will be set free because of Jesus Christ, our Messiah, for us as well. The decision to follow Jesus involves both a decision to be baptized and a decision to identify ourselves with Jesus the Messiah. Friends, if we are not baptized, we do not identify ourselves with Jesus Christ, nor are we known to be identified with him. Baptism is truly the initial way the Lord has called us to identify publicly with Him. So why do so many people choose not to be baptized? Well, I think for some of them, they've never been shown in Scripture that every time it talks about a repentance, every time it talks about moving closer to God, every time it talks about confessing our sins and turning ourselves around, it usually says, repent and be baptized. Baptism is not the, the salvation that will save you in the end, but, but baptism is an outward expression of what is going on in the heart of a person. I can remember a story of a, a girl in one of my first classes, one of my first schools, actually the first school I was at. She had a baby while she was in high school, and for her, she came up to me one day and said, do you baptize infants at your church? I said, well, you know, our, our typical response is that we dedicate kids. And it took me a while to think, why is she asking this question? But then I realized for her, if her kid was baptized, if her kid was baptized into the faith, and she even told me this later, that 
that she could almost hold that over the head of the kid and say, well, you've been baptized. So even if you don't believe in God, you've still been baptized. It's almost as though that was the seal, that, that everything was okay, and he could live however, he or she could live however they wanted to live the rest of their life, because by golly, they've been baptized. Well, there's traditions that when your kids... You've been baptized. However, I struggle with that because in the Bible it talks about repentance. So is a kid supposed to be able to repent? Well, I can remember another story, another story of a, actually one of our general superintendents in the Church of the Nazarene. He was, he was at his third, I believe his third church that he had been at, and he was, it was going very, very well. But he was talking about baptism, and he was moving towards um, allowing people and having a baptism service. And, and yet he began to ponder, when was I baptized? Well, he called his mom up one day and he said, Mom, was I baptized? And she goes, oh, of course you were baptized. I mean, your brother was baptized and I've gotten that written down, so I'm, I'm sure you've been baptized. But she couldn't remember. There was no date. Well, at that time, he was, he was the pastor of the church. I mean, what would people think if all of a sudden he was baptized? But in his heart, he knew he needed to humble himself. You know, I think that there's Sunday school teachers out there. I think there's probably board members out there. There's people that have been serving their, their church for a very long time, and, and yet they've never been baptized. And it's almost a humbling experience if you find yourself to be in that spot. But I encourage you to take that step and begin to see what God is going to unravel for you. There's another group of people, and these people are apprehensive of responding to baptism. They're apprehensive because they struggle with anxiety. They struggle with getting in front of a group of people. And what I want you to know is baptism is a time for you to identify with the body of Christ. If there was ever a time for you to relax, if there was ever a time for you to fall back into the arms of God, it would be during baptism. Because that is the time when we get to center around and come around the group of people in our church. I want to encourage everybody, if you have not been baptized, I would love to have a conversation with you. On July 5th, we are planning to have a Freedom Sunday. A Freedom Sunday where we talk about the freedom that we have in Christ. And I want to encourage you, if you've never been baptized before, if you have questions, I would love for you to come to me. But we would love to have you here. And we would love to have you here as we celebrate people that are taking the next step in their discipleship with the Lord. Well, in verse 10 it states, And when he, meaning Jesus, came up out of the water immediately, well, there's that word again, friends. This signals a significant moment in the history of what is going on. Jesus does not come, my friends, as a powerful conquering Messiah. He doesn't show up with this irresistible force. But he shows up as a submissive Messiah who yields in obedience to the baptism of John. For first century readers, this unexceptional arrival almost gives them a clue as to what kind of Messiah this is going to be. It's not going to be the kind that they have been taught that's going to come in force and take over the rest of everything. This is going to be a Messiah that does things a lot differently than they've ever been taught. It points out that one shouldn't accept sensational, big, public displays during Jesus' ministry. The kingdom of God, my friends, the kingdom of God doesn't come with sirens blaring and bombs bursting in air, but it comes quietly. It comes inconspicuously. Yet something happens in this moment. In Jesus' surrender, he saw the heavens being torn open. In Isaiah 64, 1 becomes a reality when it says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. This may have been a moment like rays of sunlight breaking through clouds ever so brilliantly after a, after a thunderstorm, as though Jesus saw a little door ajar miles up in the sky, as has been painted for us in movies. 
or may have just been a moment when God miraculously tore apart the barrier the barrier be between heaven and earth, allowing Jesus to see into the glory of heaven as though an invisible curtain right in front of us was suddenly pulled back. So that instead of the trees and instead of the flowers and instead of the buildings, or in Jesus' case, instead of the river and the sandy desert and the crowds, we are standing in the presence of a different reality altogether. You see, I believe that a good deal of Christian faith is a matter of learning to live by this different reality. Even though we can't always see it, sometimes at decisive and climactic times, the curtain is drawn back and we see or we hear what is really going on. But most of the time, we walk by faith and not by sight. And then it says, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Notice that it says, like a dove. It doesn't say literally in the form of a dove. It wasn't a bird that landed on him. The dove is the symbol of gentleness and peace and purity. You see, Jesus will conquer. But his conquest will be a conquest of love, of peace, of gentleness, of purity, Jesus was being commissioned. He was being set apart. He was being empowered by heaven itself. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, was being empowered by God's very own Spirit to do the work of God. Remember, the first reason baptism is such a profound moment is because it's a moment of decision. The second reason is that it is a moment of identification. And the third reason is it's a moment of of mission a moment of mission every true believer just as our messiah was is commissioned and is empowered by god to go out and to do his mission some commissioning experiences are, are traumatic like the heavens being torn open and other experiences though are not so dramatic it's almost like the still small voice of god's spirit tugs at the heart with an awareness that one is called Nevertheless, no matter what happens, every true believer is commissioned and empowered by God's Spirit. However, the awareness of the commission, the awareness of the power, is a different matter. Too many are not aware of God's commission and of the Spirit's presence within. What makes the difference? Our commitment to both decision and our commitment to identification too many of us lack a consistent commitment in both steps. As a result, we wander through life unaware of God's commission and unaware of God's presence of the Spirit of God empowering us to go on a mission to a lost and a dying world. Too many of us don't make a decision to follow Jesus Christ totally. We don't surrender all that we are, and we don't surrender all that we have to Christ. Therefore, we aren't aware of the great call and the commission of Christ. Too many of us never identify with Christ. Oh, sure, we maybe have even been baptized, but we never follow through on the commitment. The world never knows that we are followers of Christ because we're not committed, genuine followers. We don't live like the New Testament has instructed us in Scripture to live out our lives as disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Or 2 Corinthians 5.20 when it says, Therefore we, the ones that are baptized, the ones that have followed Christ and are following Christ, are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors for Christ. Verse 11 tells us, And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. This is a voice that sustains us. It's a voice that guides us into a whole new way of living, into a whole new way of being in this world. 
The whole Christian gospel could be summed up in this point. That when the living Lord looks at each of us, at every baptized and believing and follower of Christ, he says to us what he said to Christ on that day. He sees us not as we are in ourselves, but he sees us as we are in Christ Jesus, our Messiah. It sometimes seems impossible especially to people who have never had this kind of support from their earthly parents. But it's true. God looks at you, and God looks at me, and God says, You, my friend, are my dear, dear child. I am so delighted with you. He said that on the day of your baptism, and he has said that every day that you have decided to follow him since then. The first reason baptism is such a profound moment is it's a moment of decision. The second moment is because it is a moment of identification. The third reason is it's a moment of mission. And the fourth reason is it's a moment of assurance. No one leaves home. No one sets out on an unknown way lightly. He or she must be very sure that the decision is right. As the Son of Man a human being, Jesus Christ needed the perfect assurance of God. So much was being required of Jesus, and he was to pay such an enormous price to serve God. He needed some clear confirmation, some special strength, some encouragement from God. What God did was profound. He spoke from heaven. He declared that Jesus was his beloved son and that he was well pleased with him. God meets the needs of his servants for assurance. He sees to it that we know his will and that he gives assurance that we are doing his will as we continually follow him. He speaks to our hearts. He gives signs of his approval, of of his encouragement. We have a mission. Once again, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 tells us, And Jesus came and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, doing what with them? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. But he also gives us assurance that we'll never be alone. In Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In Isaiah 43.2, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Without those words from God, all we often hear in our mind's ear is not assurance, but it is doors being slammed in our face. The first reason baptism is such a profound moment is because it's a moment of decision. The second is it's a moment of identification. The third is that it's a moment of mission. The fourth is it's a moment of assurance. And fifth, it's a moment of the starting line and not the finish line. Baptism is the starting line of a lifelong journey with God. It's not the finish line of a relationship with Christ. So what is the solution? What is the solution from steering away from what has often been the inevitable cliff of not following Christ? Well, friends, it's discipleship. You see, the first century church was founded on relationships. Relationships that moved people beyond conversion and into community. In Acts chapter 2, the disciples were scrambling to connect baptized believers into discipling relationships because all of a sudden, in one day, there were 3,000. First, beginning of that day, 120. By the end of that day, 3,120. They were scrambling to get these people from the baptismal pools outside the temple and into relationships. Contrary to what we see today in many churches where salvation is essential and discipleship is optional, the first century Christians knew they must take Jesus' commission seriously. So what must we do? We must reframe the goal. 
the Christian life begins at baptism. We must stop acting like it is the end of the discipleship journey. It is the first step on following Christ. If our goal is only to get people saved and only to get people baptized, then we will send people off to grow by themselves. However, when we view baptism as the starting line and not the finish line, our perspective changes. So does our strategy. Believers don't stumble into spiritual maturity. It takes intention and discipline through discipleship. In conclusion, I want to say, if you're following Jesus, but you've never been baptized for a myriad of different reasons, I would love to have a conversation with you. I would love for you to come and join us and be a part of our, our baptism service on July 5th. Be baptized. It's the beginning of a brand new journey with God. God will split open the heavens, and I believe he will speak to us. If you've been baptized, but you're sitting on the sidelines and you're growing stagnant, remember, baptism is the starting line. It's not the finish line. So stand up and follow Jesus in a life journey of discipleship. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that just as your Son gave us an example of being baptized, that we would be baptized and then we would be thrust out, as we will see next week, we'll be thrust out into the mission of God. We will have assurance, God, but that we will see it as the starting line and not the finish line, that we will continue a journey with you, that we will decide today to identify ourselves with Jesus Christ so that we can see that our lives have a permanency in you and that you will continue to allow us to follow you. Continue to speak to our hearts. Continue to speak to our minds. Continue to speak to us in every avenue. We will give you honor. We will give you glory. Lord, continue to speak to our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I look forward to continuing to worship with you. I would love for you to come and join us when you are ready and able. But may God continue to truly bless your life. And may you be a blessing to others. May God bless you today. And filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their stains and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains the dying thief Rejoice to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though I'll as he, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power. Till all the ransom 
Churchill, God, be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Till all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more. Ere since by faith I saw the stream, my flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die, and shall be till I die, and shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. When this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave. And in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. And in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to sing. Day. We're sharing some of the songs that have been faithful to us and faithful in our lives and ones that we focus on at this time of the year that we can have faith and trust in God that we look at the cross but we also look that he didn't stay in the cross but he has risen he has risen indeed Dark domain and he lives forever with the 
Yeah. 
Yes, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. And it is in the power of Christ that we can't stand. It is in the power of Christ that we've been able to stand. It's in the power of Christ that we will always be able to stand. That God has given us love and mercy and grace. And that God has continued to speak to all of us. That it is this God that we look to. Even in times when things seem like they're going wrong. When it seems like the crisis is too big for any of us. We have faith and we have trust in a God. A God that we can have hope in. A God that we can have peace in. And that God would give us the opportunity to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that He is there, He's always been there, and He always will be there. Now. 